All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Cal Week webinar, Museums of Berkeley, Opportunities for Student Research, Employment, and Learning. Uh, my name is Katie Fleming, and I'm the Education Coordinator at the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology um, here at UC Berkeley. So first off, I'd like to say a huge congratulations and welcome to our newly admitted Cal Bears. Um, so woo, congrats, everyone, and a warm welcome to prospective students and other community members who are joining us today. Um, just so everyone knows, we have folks on the call today from California, from Texas, Kentucky, New York, China, Singapore, and more. So welcome to everyone who's joining us from all around the world. Um, so today's program is going to feature representatives from seven of Berkeley's research collections and museums who are speaking about opportunities for UC Berkeley students at each of their institutions. Um, so I want to thank you all for submitting such great questions in registering for this event. Uh, our panelists will be hopefully answering their questions, your questions through their introductions to their various institutions. And then at the end of the program, we're going to pull out some of those questions that you all submitted and answer them more specifically. Um, if you have any additional questions that come up during the course of this discussion, uh, there's an opportunity for you to submit them online through a platform called Slido. And the way you're going to find that is um, by navigating to sli.do in your browser or on your phone. Um, and then you're going to enter the code Berkeley Museums. So that's all one word, hashtag B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y Museums. And then from there, just select join and you can enter a question. We'll be taking a look at those throughout the course of the program and trying to address them. And if we have some time at the end, we're going to be answering those questions as well. Um, also, just so everyone knows, um, this program will not have real time captioning, but a recording of this video will be made available in the coming days and that will have captioning for accessibility and will also be shareable if you want to pass this along to anyone who wasn't able to make it in person today. Um, so Jessica, if you could bring us to the next slide. Awesome. So um, before we get started, I wanted to let you all know some logistical information about the session. For everyone's benefit, participants will be muted for the duration of the program, but as I mentioned, you'll be able to interact with us by submitting your questions at sli.do um, and entering Berkeley Museums. And uh, we recommend selecting speaker view for the best experience of this webinar. And um, lastly, contact information for each of the institutions and the speakers that you'll see today will be available at the end of the program. And we encourage you to get in contact with us individually um, if you'd like. So I'm gonna be turning it over to representatives from each of these institutions who are just gonna spend a few minutes speaking about their museums and research collections and showing you some kind of behind the scenes pictures of what student involvement can look like. Um, so first I'm gonna turn it over to Pete Oboisky to speak about the Essig Museum of Entomology. Um, and uh, so if we could go to the next slide here. And I will turn it over to you, Pete. Excellent. Thank you and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Pete Oboisky. Uh, I run the insect collection. It's the university's research collection on insects. And uh, we are one of the largest collections of insects and spiders in the country. Uh, we originally, uh, we formalized the museum in 1939, but our collections actually go back to the 1880s. We have specimens that were collected in the 1880s, which is really neat. Our focus is on Western North America, so especially California. That's our primary focus is California, but we have people doing research all over the world. Uh, personally, I work in Hawaii and French Polynesia and Indonesia, so uh, we have um, new specimens coming in all the time. The word museum can be a little deceptive. We're not just old stuff. We are uh, new things that are constantly coming in, so it's a very active collection. With over 5 million specimens, um, representing over 35,000 species of insects and spiders, and these are pins on microscope slides and preserved in alcohol. Um, some of our strengths include aphids. Professor Essig, who we're named for, studied aphids. Uh, one of our current professors now studies ground beetles, and we have a fantastic ground beetles, the carabidae. Uh, aquatic insects, uh, we have the largest small moth collection west of the Mississippi, I like to say. And bed bugs, we have the world's best collection of bed bugs. If that's not a claim to fame, I don't know what is. Uh, next, please. So we don't have a lot of employed people in the museum. So that's me and the, the first square there on the, the upper left uh, with a stick insect crawling on my face. And I have two part-time assistants that come in one or two days each year. 
the rest of our work is generally done with undergrad. So we usually have two paid undergraduates that work with us. Um, you'll be hearing URAP a lot throughout this uh, presentation. Uh, that's the Undergraduate Research Apprenticeship Program. You'll, you'll hear that over and over. Uh, so we typically have eight to 12 students that do that for credit. They actually get credit on their transcript for working with us and uh, lots and lots of volunteers. It, it varies from semester to semester how many volunteers that we have, but you can see some of the students working with us there in the collection. Next. A big part of what we're working on right now, besides all the specimens that are coming in and processing those, is actually putting our data online. And we do that by taking pictures of the specimens with their labels, and then we capture the information on those tiny little labels. You can see who collected it, where it was collected, when it was collected. All that goes into our, our database, and we figure out where are those places on a map. And so then that's called georeferencing. We can then plot all those, those insects that were collected over many years. We can plot those on a map and look at how things have changed over the years. So that's one of the great advantages to having these museum collections. We go back over 100 years in California, so we can see how insects and plants and other things have responded to climate change, land use change, routing waterways all over the world. So that's been an important part of the work we've been doing lately is trying to get our collections online for everybody to use. And one way we've been doing that is with a platform called Notes from Nature. It's citizen science. Anybody can log on and help us capture data. Next. We do quite a bit of outreach and we use a lot of student help for that because uh, on some of the days, for instance, Cal Day, which we're, we're missing this week, unfortunately, but we're doing it as Cal Week, which is great. Uh, we have thousands of people come through and you can see some of the crowds looking at our, our uh, collections there. And so we need lots of people to help answer questions, help handle some of the live insects, like the live walking sticks we have, and uh, help the little kids using the microscopes and show them different things under the microscopes. There's lots of opportunity for helping with outreach. Uh, we do classes that are within Berkeley, but we also host classes from around the Bay Area when we can. Uh, and then we have a couple other events. In February, we celebrate Charles Darwin's birthday and homecoming weekend in October. Uh, we also have an open house. Other than that, uh, the Essig Museum and a lot of the other museums are not open to the public. Uh, we are research collections, and so we have these special days throughout the year where we do let the public come in. So we all always need a lot of help for that. Next. Uh, so what kind of opportunities are there for you? Uh, well, I mentioned URAP, that's the Undergraduate Research Apprenticeship Program. That is something, uh, it's a program online, you can look that up on the Berkeley website, and you register, register for this, you apply for it, and then you'll, you'll be interviewed and you'll uh, get selected for a project in each museum. And it's not just the museums, it's all kinds of labs all across campus that, that put up opportunities like this. Um, you can apply for different projects. And the projects that I have running right now is some native plant restoration. You can see some students out planting uh, right outside of the Valley Life Science Building in that first picture. Um, the natural history of stick insects. And uh, Edward in that middle picture there wearing the white lab coat is actually doing some CRISPR injections into some of our walking sticks to see if he can uh, manipulate some of the color genes in them. Uh, so he's actually doing his senior thesis project on that working with the Essex Museum. Uh, and the Sulawesi biodiversity. So down the bottom, um, Sulawesi is an island in Indonesia and I have a big project going on sampling stuff down there and I need lots of students to help me process all those samples. Uh, but we also have volunteers. So the URAP, you actually get credit on your transcript, but volunteers, it's a, a little lower commitment where you can come in uh, where you have more time. Uh, you can help out with outreach events or in our case, whatever we happen to be doing in the museum that day, labeling, pinning insects, whatever. Uh, we also have a museum class that um, many of the museums participate in where you get to learn some uh, museum science and how to do that. Several students do senior thesis projects with us. And then for us, we have an entomology club. So you can see some students there on the right uh, taking a field trip to one of our UC field stations. They go out collecting, they spend overnight there, do some camping, collecting, and it's, it's a, a lot of fun. So lots of different opportunities at different levels. You can get credit for them, you can take them as classes, you can volunteer, um, and so lots of opportunities. So I think you're gonna hear a lot of the same sorts of things uh, from the other museums, so I'm gonna stop there, but just to tell you if you wanna find out more about opportunities with insects and spiders, get in touch with me. Thank you.
and I guess next. <laughs> Hey everyone, so um, it's me again, Katie Fleming. I'm the gallery manager and education coordinator at the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology. Um, so I'm gonna be speaking for a minute. Uh, like Pete said, a lot of our institutions have the similar types of opportunities of ways to get involved and the differences between them will really be um, the individual projects that people are working on um, and the specific areas of interest that you might have, whether it's insects or plant collections or uh, anthropological collections like here at the Hearst Museum. So objects related to people living today and in the past all over the world. So the Hearst Museum is UC Berkeley's anthropological research collection and public gallery space located in Kroeber Hall on the UC Berkeley campus. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Founded in 1901, the Hearst Museum houses over 3.8 million objects from around the world and throughout time. The oldest objects in our collection are about 2 million years old. These are hand axes from what is today Tanzania. Um, to objects that were commissioned for the Hearst Museum by local artists just in the past couple of years. So a really huge range of types of materials, um, art and and objects from around the world throughout time. Our public gallery, which features rotating exhibits um, on themes from everything as wide ranging as mind altering substances to clothing and textiles is always free for UC Berkeley students, faculty and staff to visit um, when we are open. And um, if we could go to the next slide, you'll see pictured here students from the Anthropology Undergraduate Association, which is a student group on campus. Um, so we host tours, that, they're here on a tour of the Hearst Museum. We host tours for uh, undergraduate students and student groups and all kinds of folks all around the Bay Area. But there's just so many ways for students to get involved here at the Hearst Museum. So if we go to, go to the next slide, um, you'll see some photos here of students engaging in research. We encourage both undergraduate and graduate student research working hands-on with the collections. And this can be independently initiated if you have a project that you're interested in discovering uh, yourself, you can request access to these collections to conduct your own research, or they can be conducted in the context of a course um, with a professor or faculty member or a graduate student, or um, through an undergraduate research apprenticeship, like Pete mentioned, these uh, positions that can be applied for in labs and research collections all around campus. So um, if we can go to the next slide, we also offer, offer volunteering opportunities and internships in a wide range of departments, um, from working hands-on with objects behind the scenes to working with our education team on public field trips and tours. And if we can go to the next slide, um, you'll see some folks working behind the scenes and kind of goofing off and enjoying getting to know each other in our collections. And um, on the next slide, you'll see that the Hearst employs students in work study funded positions in the museum's public exhibit space, offices and collections. So these are positions that are funded um, through your financial aid package and the cost is shared by your financial aid and our museum or another institution that offers a work study position. And these are um, staff positions uh, where you can do all kinds of work at our different museums. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, uh, there's also lots of opportunities for more casual involvement by attending the many events, tours, class visits, and workshops that we offer year round. And on the next slide, you'll see that these are everything from music and dance performances to behind the scenes tours and celebratory exhibit openings. And you can find out about these opportunities by following us on social media at Hearst Museum on all platforms, um, or by visiting our website, like you can from many of these other institutions with public arms as well. Um, so on the next slide, you'll see that many of our students, staff, volunteers, and interns and researchers have gone on to pursue new opportunities, um, taking with them the experiences that they gained at the Hearst Museum. You see here Kate Montana, who's graduating this spring. Um, she's been working with us at the Hearst Museum in collections and in our gallery for a few years now. Um, so we have alum that are conducting their own doctoral research, working as field archeologists, producing public programs at art museums and institutions around the world and more. Um, so you can bring with you the things that you learned at these museums to, to so many different kinds of opportunities and I'm actually a product of the work study program at the Hearst Museum. I graduated UC Berkeley in 2012 with a BA in anthropology and it had a work study position as an undergrad um, and since then I've been working on and off with the Hearst Museum full-time for about the past decade or so and that's all thanks to the opportunities that I was able to take advantage of as a student. Um, so if you have questions about that process feel free to reach out to me by email afterward and with that I'd like to um, say thank you. This is all of some of our staff and volunteers um, in the gallery and I'm going to be passing it over to um, Lisa White at the UC Museum of Paleontology. Hi everyone, it's Lisa White. I'm Director of Education and Outreach at the Museum of Paleontology 
And we're pretty easy to find in the Valley Life Sciences building. So you're looking at our uh, full-size T-Rex uh, replica there at the base of the Valley Life Sciences building. And if we can go to the next slide, um, I'll just mention uh, supporting what my colleagues have said is that uh, with the exception of the hearse, we're primarily a research museum. So we don't have a lot of public space, but we take full advantage of the area that we do have in the Valley Life Sciences building. And so we have exhibits on several floors. Uh, we've got some incredible casts of Triceratops in addition to the T-Rex, which we nickname the nation's T-Rex. So the original uh, is at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, but it was found by a rancher uh, who continues to work with some of our collection staff in Montana. Uh, and so in addition to uh, those dinosaur fossils, uh, we certainly have a range of other fossils as well in our collection. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, it really sort of captures the scope of organisms that we have. So as a paleontology museum uh, and in our uh, work in uh, the fossil record, uh, we have microfossils as old as billions of years old. We have vertebrate fossils that not only include dinosaurs and reptiles, but uh, mammals as well. Uh, we have a pretty awesome paleobotany collection, uh, as well as a large collection of fossil invertebrates and including some uh, modern specimens as, as well. Uh, if we go to the next slide, there are just some bulleted points here, some quick facts about the Museum of Paleontology. So we're getting pretty excited. Next year's our Jubilee, so 100 years since the museum was established, although I should mention that some parts of our collection even predate uh, the formal founding of the Museum of Paleontology. So in the uh, 1840s, when teams of Earth scientists that were uh, part of the gold rush parties uh, would go to mountains like the Sierra Nevada, primarily look for mineral resources. When they would, would encounter fossils, those were also natural resources that belonged to the state. And so that formed some of our initial collection. And so even before the University of California was chartered as a campus and before the museum was officially founded, uh, we had these these collections. So although they are primarily for uh, research use, and we do have an amazing uh, number of these fossils, 5 million when you count them all, from the microfossils, which is actually what I study, to the large vertebrates, uh, including fossil bears, that's uh, quite a collection. And a lot of my role as the education director uh, is to oversee our award-winning website, so Understanding Evolution, Understanding Science, and we'll be launching Understanding Global Change soon. Our resources that uh, educators, pre-college educators use, but they're also very useful for undergraduate audiences as well. And our staff and uh, faculty and graduate students that all uh, utilize the collection and make up the UCMP personnel are a very tight-knit group of folks that really uh, run the range of specialties. And before I came to work at the UCMP, I always thought it was a rumor that we had fossils stored in the Campanile, but we really do. So um, that uh, is a whole incredible story in itself too. So if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll focus a little bit on what some of the students do at the museum. Uh, so like the other museums, we have opportunities for uh, undergraduate researchers in the apprenticeship program on campus. We have quite a lot of grant funded research as well. And so there can be paid positions also. Uh, we have students that utilize our collection for senior theses and special projects. And we recently acquired uh, an amazing new microscope that's able to image, uh, you're looking at a fossil insect there preserved in amber. So it's such a, a really a fascinating range of opportunities that students have to work at the museum and we're always excited to share those unique experiences. If we go to the next slide, I'll just highlight. So there I am with two of our undergraduate research assistants and I should mention I was a faculty member at San Francisco State University for 20 years before I came to Berkeley eight years ago. And so some of the collection that I curated as a paleontologist at San Francisco State 
came to Berkeley with, with a grant. And so students helped me with that kind of curation. There is a need to share these collections, not only in actual form, but also in digital form too. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we're very much invested in the skills that we want our students to acquire as they're learning along with us. So in addition to learning all sorts of um, taxonomic identification and curation and collection best practices, uh, we are certain that our students learn all sorts of good lab techniques that they can carry on no matter the major. I mean, we have students that are art majors and earth science, biology, even music, but they acquire all sorts of skills working with us. So I just have uh, uh, one or two more slides. And with the next slide, uh, we do uh, certainly ensure that our students have fun, they acquire a range of skills, as I mentioned. There's uh, photography that's important with some of the digitization projects that we have. Uh, these students are working with a large collection uh, from the a uh, couple counties over where uh, Caltrans uh, is putting a new dam site in. And so there's such a range of fossils there from whales to sharks and plant fossils too. And uh, in the last slide, I'll just highlight uh, how much we share our science uh, during programs like Cal Day when we're able to have it on campus. And so students are central to a sharing science as well. And so public outreach and science communication is a big part of my job as well. And with the last slide, uh, these are just some ways that you can uh, contact us and find out more about all our uh, web resources. As I mentioned, they're widely used for instructional purposes. And we just really try to share out as much as we can uh, about the nature of our collection and the fossil record that we think is useful uh, for a wide variety of disciplines. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, next, I'm uh, going to turn it over to Bampa. Is Lynn here and able to join us? If you wouldn't mind turning on your video, Lynn, I'll spotlight your video so you can tell us about the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Um, so it looks like we're having a little trouble getting her on. So we're just going to go ahead and um, we're going to go ahead and skip through these next few slides at the Berkeley Art Museum. Um, and I'm going to pass it along to um, Brent at the Jepson Herbaria. So let me just uh, get you on here. Perfect. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, good to uh, talk to all of our new students. I'll. Uh, Rather than repeating a lot of what the other folks have talked about, I'll just uh, give you a more of a faculty perspective. My name is Brent Mishler. I'm a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology, and I'm also the director of one of the natural history museums, which is this one, the University in Jepson Herbaria, which is a natural history museum that preserves plants. I'll show you a uh, picture of what a specimen looks like. It's different than the Botanic Garden, which you'll hear about in a minute. They have the live plants, we have the dead preserved plants, but we still do interesting things with them even though they're dead. Like the other museums, we have undergraduate research opportunities and public outreach and databases and, and web uh, outreach, which I'll just briefly mention. But let me mention a little bit more from the faculty perspective. Most of the museums have what are called faculty curators, which are faculty members in several different departments that are related to the mission of the particular museum. And these faculty members engage in regular faculty research, but involving the uh, collections and involving both graduate students, which we haven't mentioned much of. You guys are incoming undergrads, but you'll get to interact with lots of uh, really brilliant uh, graduate students. We have a very uh, big and, and uh, excellent graduate program. So there's your standard research grants that have uh, opportunities to work in uh, research right along with uh, faculty and graduate students and postdocs. And then we also teach uh, classes, regular classes in the curriculum. In addition to the classes for the public that are out in the field, we teach classes for 
uh, you guys, for students. And I'm going to show you a list of the botanically related ones, but there are many related to paleontology and zoology and entomology and anthropology and so forth uh, as well. Next slide. Everybody has introduced this idea of specimens, and here's what a plant specimen looks like. It's a flat sheet that has the pr plant uh, pressed onto it with data about the plant attached to it. These are, even though they may not be as exciting as a live plant or a live animal, they are providing a record of a, a point location for a particular species at a particular point in time. And together in their millions, it lets us um, understand many aspects of their, their biology and their evolution and their ecology and their uses and the conservation and so forth. So all this ancillary information that's in the databases that goes along with the specimens, together with the specimens, makes a very rich resource for uh, research. Uh, next slide. And as Pete mentioned, what we're doing with all the museums, thanks to funding from the National Science Foundation, is we're busy making the data uh, available. We're transcribing it into databases in such a way that people can use the specimens to a large extent uh, remotely, even though they do have to come in and look at specimens or borrow them from time to time. And the combination of making millions of records of specimens available and also uh, advances in sequencing DNA and building big phylogenetic trees allows us to do some spectacular research in the last few years that we could have never thought of doing before. The uh, genomes are present in these specimens to a large extent, and we are able to uh, bring that information along with all the other information and understand them uh, better. Next slide. Undergraduates are the mainstay of the digitizing efforts in the museums. This work study program that a couple of people have mentioned uh, brings a lot of undergraduates in for paid research and, and digitizing. And there's also uh, the opportunity to earn units through the URAP program that you've already heard about. These aren't for any particular majors, they're for any interested undergraduate, lower division or upper division. And like the other museums, we have uh, integrated undergraduates as both workers and researchers uh, within the general milieu. So this is a team in the digitizing lab busy taking images of specimens and then getting the data off the labels and getting it into a database. Uh, next slide, which I think is the last one. And this will segue, this relates to the botanic garden, which I think is next on the list. These are just selected classes in the regular curriculum that are for undergraduates. I think Pete already mentioned the Natural History Museums course, which is a great one, covers all the museums, not just plants. But these are the courses listed here from both integrated biology, plant and microbial biology, and also environmental science policy and management, all cover different aspects of the, uh, the biology of plants in the very broad sense, including fungi and how they relate to each other in ecosystems and so forth. So a good place to start for any of the museums, including the herbarium, would be to start with the website. The website will list the faculty curators. It will also list the research staff and the graduate students. And if you're interested in one of the museums, the way to get an entree into it is by uh, contacting these folks that are in an area that you're interested in and get the ball rolling to uh, see what you can do in that museum. And uh, I'm uh, all done, and so we'll pass it on, I think, to the Botanic Garden. Hello, I'm Christy Manu. I'm the Education Director at the UC Botanical Garden, which is one of the most diverse plant collections in the world. Next slide. So, um, as Brent said, we are the Living Plant Museum, and um, we're ranked first in the nation and sixth in the world in terms of our diversity of botanical taxa. We might not be the largest um, botanical garden, but we do have one of the largest collections, primarily of wild collected plants. And the reason why that's important is because our plants have the DNA that is true to type and can be used by researchers around the world. 
Um, over 2,000 of, of our plants are rare or, or endangered um, in their native habitat. And in addition to those plants that are from places around the world that we house in our collection, we also have a robust conservation effort around a few California native plants that are particularly endangered. Um, we are a living plant museum. So as a museum, every plant we have is cataloged and accessioned. And we do have an online database. So if you're wondering if we have a particular plant in our collection, you can go online, type it in, and it'll tell you exactly where in the garden it is growing. Um, our plants are primarily arranged geographically by place of origin, and it creates um, a stunning display over our 34 acres that helps tell the story of native habitats. So next slide. Um, so this is a screen capture from our website that shows you the range of collections we have in the garden. So as I said, they're primarily geographically arranged, um, and we have every continent represented except one, of course, being Antarctica. We also have a few collections that are ethnobotanically arranged. So these are plants that have significant human uses, and they include things like our Crops of the World garden and our uh, medicinal herb garden. And then we have a couple that are taxonomically arranged, so like our palm and cycad garden and um, our orchid, fern, and carnivorous plant house. So those have plants that are from different places around the world that are um, arranged together. Next slide. In terms of how Cal students might uh, utilize the garden, first and foremost, I always want to say to Cal students that we are your garden. We are one of those few collections that um, are open to the public year round. So you can come uh, enter the garden for free any day we're open. And it can be not only a place for coursework, but also just a place that you can use as a respite. Um, connecting with nature, just relaxing. We do have Wi-Fi around our buildings. Um, so we really want you to use it uh, to the greatest extent possible. Um, as Brent mentioned, there's a bunch of integrative biology classes that use this, but I also wanted to bring up that there's um, over 58 different types of classes, um, UC Berkeley classes that utilize us in their coursework. And these also include um, areas of study like art and design, literature, um, really it uh, runs the gamut of different uh, subject areas that can use the plant world in different ways for inspiration. Um, in terms of research, we don't coordinate um, research projects directly, but we provide plant material or sites that can be used for research projects. And these are not only plant projects, but also utilizing the garden's fauna. So we've had in the past students who have studied um, like the Western fence lizard that's prolific in our garden. There's newts, insects, birds. So um, there's really a whole range of uh, natural um, subjects that you can study utilizing the garden. In terms of paid work experience opportunities, um, we also primarily hire work study students who have work study as part of their financial aid package, but we have a couple positions sometimes that uh, don't require that. And because we're a public museum, there's a range of um, departments that utilize students. So in our uh, visitor kiosk entrance booth, we hire students. There's also horticulture jobs. Uh, jobs and curation, and then limited jobs in our education department. We also have a broad outreach program. Um, there's also uh, a class that is for units that is um, uh, working with our horticulturalists. So if you're particularly interested in that, there is um, a, a class for academic units in that area. Um, we also have a robust volunteer program. So uh, prim primarily at our plant sales, we love to get students helping out with those. Um, and I do want to mention that we, as a public museum, we do have our own uh, classes and workshops that you can partake in. And again, this is the whole range of things associated with plants and out of doors. So we have photography workshops, we have art classes, um, in addition to um, various uses of plants from uh, herbal studies to natural dyeing. It's really um, the broad range of, of things involving people and plants. So the last slide I just wanted to leave you with um, our director Lou Feldman's um, 
sort of motto for the garden, which is I speak for plants. And we hope you'll join us in telling the stories of plants. So that's it. Thank you. Hi, folks. Um, my name is Michelle Rodriguez, and I work at the Lawrence Hall of Science. I'm our visitor and community services or community experiences director, and I'm here with Bia. Hi, everybody. My name is Bia. I am a museum facilitation coordinator for the Lawrence Hall. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about different student opportunities after Michelle introduces what the hall is all about. Cool. So the Lawrence Hall of Science is um, uh, UC Berkeley's public science center. Um, it's an interactive science center. So we have a bunch of hands on exhibits. We actually don't have collections, but we'll often bring collections from or sometimes on occasion, we'll bring collections from some of the other um, UC Berkeley uh, institutions and highlight them in some special ways um, for our public. Um, we not only have a museum floor or a science center floor, but we also do work on um, writing curriculum. There are three major curriculum arms in um, housed at the hall. And we do a lot of teacher professional learning opportunities and helping school districts increase their capacity to serve students. We do a bunch of education research as well. And so we have a research arm that participates in that. And there are some student positions that are available through um, doing some educational data collection and research um, too. If you um, could go to the next slide. Uh, we use, um, we have a lot of wonderful fun things. If you can see where I'm talking, this is an example of one of our exhibits. It's called Design Quest. And we have a lot of focus on um, participants being able to enjoy actually like interacting with exhibits and making things and going through the design process. And we have our student staff that are the facilitators for those experiences. So the majority of the work that we do up at the hall is all about science communication. And as a student, if you participate with us, either as a job or um, as a volunteer, you get to learn those um, valuable science communication skills and um, both in informal and formal education opportunities. And just like in the botanical garden, we're free for students to come as visitors. We encourage you to come on up here. We have a beautiful view. And um, sometimes we have a lot of fun things. We just had a um, VR experience exhibit and we had a game ex uh, exhibit recently too. So it's fun to actually play around as well as just visit or work there. Um, I'll pass it over to Bia for the next two slides. Awesome. So you can move to the next slide. And there's a lot of different opportunities for student jobs at the Hall. Uh, I recently graduated last May. I was an undergraduate at Cal and I worked at the Lawrence Hall and now I'm working there full time. But when I was working there, I worked as a museum facilitator. So we have a team of student educators to help the public, mostly families and children in field trips, engage with the exhibits that we have. So we help them build rockets and we help them um, on this picture over here, our friend Vivian is helping someone build like a spacecraft, which is really fun. Uh, we also do a lot of science presentations, either with live animals. We also do story time. If you're into presenting, uh, we also have a digital interactive planetarium, and we also hire students uh, to uh, present the planetarium shows, um, which is really fun. Uh, we also hire students to present um, birthday parties. So if you're looking for a weekend job where you can hang out with kids and help them have a fun birthday, uh, that's a very fun opportunity as well. Uh, we also have student staff, uh, all of our uh, cashiers. Uh, so either at the entrance selling tickets or at the toy and bookstore or at our cafe. There's a lot of different opportunities there. We have an animal discovery room where we have over a hundred live animals of over 50 different species. Uh, so there's a huge team of students that are there ensuring the animals are safe and taken care of. And on the afternoon, that room is also open for the public. So you can help with um, like education about animal science, which is really fun. Um, there's also some opportunity um, to get involved in the kind of back 
background of the museum through uh, cultivating membership and helping with fundraiser. Uh, there's also some opportunities in marketing uh, for mostly helping with social media engagement uh, with our marketing team. And I think Michelle mentioned it before as well. Um, some opportunity with like data analysis or data collection for um, educational research, which is really interesting as well. And we can move to the next slide. So all of the job openings are posted on our website, so you can browse what openings are going on at any time at lawrencehollowscience.org slash jobs. Uh, we hire both work study and non work study students. There's opportunity for both at the hall. All the positions that I mentioned before, they uh, require at least an eight hour a week commitment, I think with the exception of the birthday presenters that are only a weekend. Uh, job, but there's a lot of opportunity to gain experience in science communication and education and also customer service. I feel like I learned a lot about customer service <laughs> by working at the job because we are kind of on stage all day uh, in a museum that's open for the public at all times. Uh, the Lawrence Hall, it's kind of far away from campus. Uh, you might have seen on the picture before, we're up on the hill and you can overlook the view, but there's a free shuttle that you can take up there. And it's a nice place to come visit to relax too during your finals and midterms. Uh, we're always open and free for students. And we can move on from this one. Thank you. So um, just before we move to audience questions, we're gonna loop back real quick to the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lynn as we uh, just switch back to those slides just for a moment. Hi, can everybody hear me? Hopefully, okay. So uh, I'm Lynn Kimura. I'm the Friesen Collection Engagement Associate and Academic Liaison. It's a very long title uh, at BAMPFA, uh, which is kind of the art and film uh, focused uh, sort of town square for the campus. Um, the next slide, please. Okay, so for student research, um, most of it's done through classes, but we do have drop in centers for both art and film. Um, the Helsel Works on Paper Study Center, the Lieber Conceptual Art Study Center, and the Cahill Asian Art Study Center um, contain about uh, 4,000 of our 23,000 works of art. And you can look them up on our website um, and our database uh, and make appointments to come view things for your own research, for your own enjoyment. So anything from Ming Dynasty scrolls and ceramics to Durer prints to Warhol Polaroids and all are all there and available for research and for enjoyment. Um, you'll you just really have to sort of look things up and then email me. Uh, and my email should be around soon. We also have a film library, which is one of the really wonderful resource sensors on campus um, for film and video. We have re uh, reference books. We have 100,000 clippings packets on various films, directors, artists, um, editors, actors, etc. cetera. Uh, and part of this is online on our Cinephiles database, also available on our website. Uh, no. uh, we have some of the best librarians around for this. They can find pretty much anything on film and video that you want to see. And there are film posters, scripts, um, all sorts of things. So it's a really wonderful um, uh, resource for anything to do with film. Uh, so next slide, please. So we, uh, because we're open five days a week plus um, for films, we have a lot of work study students, um, probably 300 or, or a little over. Um, employed every single year. Um, probably half of these are gallery attendants. So you're people who are in the gallery to make certain that the art is safe, that the people are safe, um, that things uh, run well and to answer questions and so forth. We also have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, film ushers for our film program and we do um, almost 500 film screenings a year. So lots of ushering to do uh, and it's a really wonderful opportunity if you love film to, to be able to see a, a large part of our program. Um, people like Errol Morris, the documentary interest, um, filmmaker, Teresa Cha and so forth, have gone into film after being ushers at our PFA theater and seeing dozens and dozens of films um, from around the world um, every semester. Uh, we also have um, admissions desk personnel uh, people who work at our uh, bookstore and uh, uh, and a smaller number of students who work for various departments um, anything from our social media department our IT department um, uh, our schools and education 
um, department and so forth. So all of these can be found either on our website or on the work study site. Um, you can look, up, look us up. And all. these are in the picture. These are students who are, are um, in, in charge of talking about our uh, Masako Miki uh, exhibition um, last year, which was very fun. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. We have a student committee, which is one of the more, more intensive ways of wor um, working with the museum and the film archive. Um, every year we have, a, there are about 30 to 35 students, uh, and it's an application. Um, you can go to the BAN PFA student committee Facebook page, and, when, and they do a call for submissions for, um, twice a year. Um, and, all. and they put together outreach events, parties, uh, student film festivals, special film screenings. They do a um, DJ for a silent film where they put together the various music that goes along with, um, with what's playing on the screen. Uh, they do um, career days uh, and, uh, and, they, and this is the one where, place where you have sort of student creativity on show because um, we've had things like a student um, fashion show, a student photography and so forth. Um, we don't do exhibitions of student work directly. Um, you know, most of our exhibitions are planned three or four years out uh, and so forth uh, involving, you know, international artists. Um, but we do have, um, with the student committee, ch chances to um, sort of sh be within the museum and showcase creativity that way. Uh, let's see. Oh, but there is a, the one thing is there are student film festivals. Uh, and all. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, there will be a cool, um, they, the student committee will do a call for student, short student films, uh, and, all, uh, and then they'll be viewed, and a selection of them will be um, part of a, the student um, film festival in our theater. So that's most of, you know, that's the most direct way that we showcase student um, creativity. Okay, so uh, let's see, next slide. Okay, so. Um, just sort of our general um, uh, program, we do 20 gallery exhibitions. Uh, right now we were cut short, obviously, uh, and all we were having uh, this amazing uh, quilt exhibition by Rosie Lee Tompkins uh, in the fall, cross fingers, we're doing um, uh, uh, art, a huge art exhibition on new art that's um, been uh, inspired by feminisms around the world. Uh, and all we also have things that you know that look at traditional art, Asian art, uh, contemporary art, and performance. We do 250 plus in person presentations of, with, by filmmakers, artists, editors, animators, um, poets, dancers, etc. It's you know, it's a very robust and vibrant program. Um, about 21,000 of our 144,000 visitors um, were Cal students last year. Uh, we also do special tours for things like Berkeley Connect um, that, that sort of drill in on how to look at uh, art, how to look at things in general in a way that can be resonant with any number of kinds of classes, courses, majors, and so forth. Uh, and all. We also have um, student curated exhibitions that are part of our Cal Conversations program. Um, these are organized through Berkeley seminars and also um, in a number of different departments, not only history of art, practice of art, architecture, and film studies, which are our core sort of groupings, uh, but also through Spanish and Portuguese, um, through geography, and so forth. So it's one thing to, to keep an eye out for are some of the seminars where students um, curate an exhibition or co-curate an exhibition with some of our own curators and staff. Um, just a reminder, um, with your gallery ID, you get into the galleries for free um, anytime we're open, which is Wednesday through Sunday, 11 through 7, and you get half off of our film screenings. Um, as I said, we do nearly 500 of those a year. It's a really wonderful way in four years to learn about film history, um, international film, uh, experimental film, and so forth. Okay, I think that's it. <laughs> Great, so with that, um, we are going to open it up to some of the questions that you all submitted in the uh, registration for this event. So um, for our first question, um, which is one that I think ho hopefully we've answered some of these questions in speaking about, um, about each of our institutions, but uh, to start off, 
we had the question, if I wanted to apply, and I'll just remind everyone too, if you still want to ask a question, you can do so at a website called Slido by typing in sli.do into your browser or on your phone and entering the event code Berkeley Museum. So that's B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y Museums um, and asking your question there, we'll try to get to those as well. But our first question, um, I'm gonna direct to uh, Lisa at the Museum of Paleontology. If I wanted to apply for a research internship or job opportunity at a museum, how would I go about applying? Great, well, uh, there are a couple of different channels. Uh, we've, um, just about all of us have touched on the URAP program, so undergraduate research apprenticeship program, and the university manages that website. And so many of us have our listings of museum opportunities on that website. And so students uh, before each semester uh, make a habit of browsing those sites if they're looking for opportunities, uh, those are unpaid. But for paid positions, you know, it just depends on what combination of funding, uh, funded projects that we have. And so for, for that, uh, you can direct emails to any one of us that presented uh, from the museums and then we can route uh, your inquiries to uh, the, the right staff. So if there's a particular fossil group in our museum that interests you, uh, then there may be a possibility of working on that. But a lot of times it just depends on uh, what our uh, projects are prioritized for that year or for that semester. But we certainly um, want to make ourselves available, you know, many of us uh, staff members to answer questions about opportunities. So you can directly um, contact us or the URAP site that was terrific for just getting a sense and overview of the different opportunities at each museum. Great, thank you. So our next question is gonna be um, for Christine at the UC Botanical Gardens. Um, are opportunities at our museums and research collections and gardens only intended for certain majors or are they available to lots of different types of students? Yeah, so I hope it um, came through that for a lot of us, the opportunities can be used across different disciplines. Um, and especially those of you who are interested in education uh, in the sciences, I think a lot of the opportunities around um, learning how to um, connect with folks um, in expressing these different science topics, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there that's uh, cross-disciplinary. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of them cut across majors. Great, thank you so much. So the next question I'm gonna to direct to um, Brent Mischler at the UC, the University in Jepson Herbaria. Um, and this question is, uh, could opportunities at UC Berkeley museums correlate to general or major specific credits? I think we've covered it pretty well already in the different uh, museum presentations, but just to summarize, the answer is yes. Uh, there are independent research units that you can sign up for and take with faculty that are in uh, a bunch of different departments that are related to particular museums. That's where you get uh, three units, let's say, for coming in and working on a project under the supervision of the professor. Counts toward your major and is certainly something you absolutely want to do at Berkeley. One of the things that makes Berkeley stand out is research. So don't come in here and only take courses, do some independent research. But the museum related courses that we've discussed and many others that we haven't mentioned also count toward many of the majors and you just have to look at the uh, particular majors to see which ones they count for, but um, there are these museum affiliated undergraduate courses certainly count as well. Great, thank you so much. So the next question um, I'm gonna direct to the folks at the Lawrence Hall of Science. And this question is, what opportunities are available for underclassmen, specifically for freshmen? Um, I'm seeing some questions related to this coming in um, to our Slido at sli.do, um, hashtag Berkeley Museums. Um, so continue to ask your questions there. But this question is, are there opportunities for underclassmen and freshmen? And are there prerequisites for applying to these opportunities? 
Yeah, I'll speak for the Lawrence Hall Science specifically. Uh, most of the opportunities for student involvement are through jobs and underclassmen are welcome to apply as well. We have a lot of freshmen uh, in our team that stay with us for either until they graduate or for a little while. Uh, there's no really any prerequisites uh, for applying for these opportunities, but if anyone from a different museum has a different answer to that, I would invite you to jump in otherwise. No. Yeah, we're getting we're getting some questions specifically about opportunities at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific mm -hmm. Film Archive. So um, I'm going to switch the view over to Lynn here and ask a couple of questions. Um, we're getting the questions. How competitive is the application process for the student committee? Mm -hmm. um, and do film or art students get priority for work study and student committee um, positions mm -hmm. at the Berkeley Art Museum? Um, okay. And just kind of generally how how competitive are these various positions? Sure. And uh, the student committee is fairly competitive. I mean, as I said, we have, um, it's about 30 students. We sort of go through and add 10 um, per, per year, um, depending on how many people have sort of, uh, you know, graduated out. Uh, so it's maybe 10 to 15 and all. Um, we usually get 50 applications. So it's not, you know, it's not impossible to, to do and all, but you do have to, um, submit your your resume a letter of saying you know why you'd be the perfect person um to be uh, on the student committee uh, and then there's a a, a short uh, either by video or in person interview with some of the people who are currently on the committee um both to answer questions and just to see what the fit would like to be but um probably more than half are in as I, what i was calling you know our core departments practice of art history of art um, architecture and film and all. But that means half of them are not. Um, we have, um, for some reason, a lot of molecular cell and biology students who've been part of the student committee, um, geog as I said, geography, um, English, the, the, uh, and all. Um, not a lot of chemistry. I keep thinking you guys must have a lot of labs. But anyway, um, but so yeah, people are really, the main criteria is that you're really interested and you say that you're going to be dependable for what we need to do. And, you know, we try not to, to uh, arrange things around midterms and finals, obviously. Um, for, under, um, for opportunities to work at the museum, to get paid for work study and all, um, we have to hire 300 students a year. We actually um, do interview people. There is absolutely nothing that says what kind of major you have to be. It's more a question that, can you work with the public? Are you interested in learning more about our exhibitions and our films? Um, are you dependable? Um, and it's really the kind of things that any job um, will want. And we have lots of freshmen who come in and do it. Um, any number of them who spend four years, as I said, soaking up film or becoming experts in, in our collections and so forth. So uh, absolutely, check it out as, as soon as you get your um, your work study monies in hand and uh and we'll be, really be happy to interview you and welcome you to the um to the museum staff great thanks so much lynn so we just have um one more minute left so i'm actually going to ask that we switch to the slide with our contact information so that those of you that want to get in touch with us are able to do so um and i'm gonna um invite on a, a representative from the essig museum to speak a little bit about student involvement um, at our institutions. Um, and then for those of you that would like to stick around for a minute, we'll be happy, uh, those of us that are available to answer a few more questions. So I'm gonna turn it over. You need to unmute, Akina. So Takina, I was wondering if you can tell us about, from a student's perspective, what it's like to, to work with the museums and with the professors and why that's important for students to get involved. Yeah, so um, I, yeah, so I work in the Essie Museum and I think the major uh, advice that I would say that I wish I could have given my younger self is to don't be afraid to apply, don't be afraid to get involved and try and be persistent when you're trying to get involved. So. You know, there's a lot of opportunities, and if you don't get one opportunity that you want, then there's so many more that are out there. So, like, just keep trying, and uh, if you can't get a work study job, try volunteering in the beginning, and then maybe you'll work your way up to a work study job. Build rapport with people, you know. 
with Europe, there's so many opportunities to get research. So you can also build connections from your research mentors to different museums. And I would also say that if you're not sure what museum you want to work for, the museums class is really, really good introduction to all the museums and like the kind of work that you'll be able to do. For instance, if you're interested in like zoology, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology is huge at, the, at Berkeley. So, and they weren't speaking today. So I just want to like shout them out too. So yeah. Great, thank you so much, Sakina. Um, so there's a few more questions that have come in. So I'm just gonna say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, and we're gonna be sending out um, some follow-up information for those of you that have registered for this, uh, for this talk. Um, so I am seeing here that um, some of our contact information is actually missing from this slide. So I'll make sure that everyone is able to get that contact information um, as well as further information about all of our various institutions. Um, and uh, I'm also gonna send out a quick poll right now to get some feedback from all of you about uh, this uh, webinar today so that we can continue to make these helpful in the future. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute to respond to some of these que questions while we um, answer some more questions from the audience. Um, so we got one question here specifically for the Museum of Paleontology. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Lisa to answer this question. The question from the audience is, is there a specific major that's recommended to be involved in paleontology? Yes, and there are two majors I would recommend. Uh, so either integrative biology or earth and planetary sciences. So typically an undergraduate can uh, enter or develop skill in paleontology from either major. So when I was an undergraduate, I didn't go to Cal, I went to San Francisco State and then UC Santa Cruz, but I majored in geology as an undergraduate. And then as a graduate student, I specialized in earth sciences, so more broadly earth system science and also paleontology and micropaleontology. So we have students on trajectories to study paleontology in graduate school that do minors in earth science and major in integrated biology or they'll flip it. But we really think uh, both are important in the training. So great question. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and answer one other question and I uh, welcome anyone else, um, any of our other panelists today who wanna answer this question, but um, it was, can newly admitted transfer students jump into museum positions without prior experience at Berkeley specifically? Um, and the answer is emphatically yes. Uh, some of our most involved students, um, at least at the Hearst Museum and I'm sure for other institutions at Berkeley are transfer students. Um, I find that transfer students really recognize the fact that their time at UC Berkeley is limited um, and it's really beneficial for them to take advantage of as many opportunities as possible. So I recommend um, freshmen to kind of take a tip from transfer students in that uh, recognizing that there is a limited amount of time while you're at UC Berkeley to take advantage of these opportunities. And like we mentioned, there's so many opportunities at all of our institutions that don't have any prior experience required. All that we really ask is a passion for what you're doing and excitement and responsibility and reliability um, for us to be able to call on you to work together um, to help you conduct your own research, to help you gain experience that's gonna take you to your next opportunity after you graduate from UC Berkeley. Um, did anyone else want to speak to the transfer student question any further? Okay, um, so I think that answers most of our questions um, from our audience today. So I just wanna say thank you again to all of our panelists. I really appreciate the thoughtful perspectives you gave for everyone. And um, I hope that all of you pr prospective students and newly admitted students um, continue to reach out to us. And um, thank you to everyone. And uh, I hope to see you here. Oh, we got one more question. Um, if this question is for Lynn at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, um, are there opportunities for non-work study students um, to acquire jobs at your institution? And, uh, generally, no. And all. most of ours are undergraduate um, sort of 
interaction with students uh, and all comes through the work studies uh, program. Um, there are, and, and the student committee, obviously. Um, I'm just trying to think, and through classes. So yeah, it's, we're not set up to have a lot of volunteers and interns other, other than through work study and through classes, sorry. Thanks so much. Um, so I'll just say thank you to everyone. Please feel free to get in touch with all of us and we'll follow up with further information by email. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and congratulations again to all of our newly admitted students. Um, we are excited to see you around campus when we're all back together and we hope you all have a, uh, a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so much. Thanks for